Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Johannes Urpelainen. I am a professor at Johns Hopkins University and the founding director of the Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy. We are just going to wait a few minutes to uh, let people trickle in, and uh, we are going to open the, the discussion in just uh, another two or three minutes. Okay, why don't we get started? Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, I'm Johannes Urpelain and I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the founding director of the Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy. Today we are having a special webinar uh, on the impact of pandemic lockdown on livelihood, food security and hygiene practices in the state of Jharkhand. Uh, I, I thank everybody for attending uh, our uh, presentation. The way we are going to do this presentation is that I'm first going to invite the uh, lead author of the study, uh, Diksha uh, Bijlani, uh, give a brief presentation uh, on the uh, findings of our research. And then after that, I'm going to invite, invite uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rai uh, to uh, offer his remarks on the uh, COVID-19 situation and the livelihood issues in, in the uh, state of Jharkhand. We are then going to open it uh, up for a Q&A uh, so please use the um, Q&A function uh, on, on Zoom. Uh, if you have any difficulty, just let us know and uh, we will help you uh, with, with, with using that. And I hope we can have a, a good discussion about the situation and uh, possible options for uh, moving forward. If you're interested in uh, looking at the study itself, uh, we have written a policy brief. It's available on the ICEP uh, website. So all you need to do is uh, just go to the website, which is size icep Org, and uh, you will be able to find it there uh, under publications. During the presentation, I'm also going to provide everybody with a, a direct link uh, to the policy brief. And with that, um, Diksha, uh, I would now like to invite you to uh, open uh, the discussion with your presentation. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Johannes, and um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, findings uh, from a survey that ICEP and Mosul India did on um, the impact of the pandemic lockdown as soon as it, is, it was instituted and, um, and with some recommendations um, informed by these findings. So um, for a brief timeline of how the lockdown was instituted, it's, it's actually interesting to note that Jharkhand um, announced its, lock, its lockdown three days before India did. Um, and then uh, India went into subsequent phases of extension of the lockdown. Um, and then on June 1st, India entered its reopening uh, uh, period of lockdown, which it calls Unlock 1.0 and Unlock 2.0. And Jharkhand actually uh, continued with extending its lockdown. And at the moment, the lockdown has been extended till, till July 31st, which is not true of all the other states in India. Um, given which there are some activities that are prohibited in Jharkhand specifically, which uh, may not be the case in other states. And one of these that I would like to note is um, religious places. So in India's um, guidelines for uh, the reopening, a lot of states have opened religious places of religious worship, but Jharkhand actually uh, decided to continue the curbs on not only religious places, but also um, commercial activity um, like hotels and restaurants. And uh, therefore, since the, the lockdown in Jharkhand has been more rigorous, um, owing not less to the fact that 5.5 lakh migrant workers returned to the state, um, uh, we were very interested to study what the impact of this lockdown has been on livelihood, on food security, and also on hygiene practices and social distancing in the state. 
So a little bit about the survey itself. Um, it was a phone survey, the sample size was 895 and it was conducted across the 24 districts in the state. Um, the questions were um, uh, about loss of livelihood or reduction in working hours. It was about whether people had received uh, government assistance and, um, and it was also about whether they've been following um, hand washing guidelines and whether they've been social distancing. Uh, the median age was, um, I mean, the sample was middle-aged, if you call 35 a uh, middle-aged. It was predominantly Hindu, and um, um, I mean, 83% of it was from SCST or other backward caste, so non-general. Um, the findings show that when it comes to livelihood, 60% of respondents actually lost their jobs or had a reduction in working hours. And 43% of them had such cash constraints that they had to borrow money even to survive. Um, out of the people who did lose their jobs or had a reduction in working hours, we see um, a very high proportion of casual labor and then farmers. Um, Jharkhand is also predominantly, well, 26.2% of Jharkhand is scheduled tribes. So we also looked at uh, what the impact of this was on the tribal population. And what we found was that um, the tribal respondents in the survey were more likely to be uh, involved in the two uh, uh, occupations which were most affected by the lockdown in terms of livelihood. So casual labor and farming. And this is also in line with um, surveys that the Ministry of Tribal Affairs has done, which shows that actually ST households have a higher probability of being engaged in casual labor and farming than the national average. And they also tend to have a higher percent, uh, 10 percentage point higher um, poverty rate than the state average in Jharkhand. Some good news that the government assistance programs have actually been effective in Jharkhand in such that 85% um, of respondents actually said that they did receive food assistance from a government shop. And uh, uh, this is owing to the fact that as soon as the lockdown was announced, Jharkhand actually uh, went ahead and uh, announced cash transfers for migrants. It announced uh, two months in advance, advance of like food grains to ration card holders. It also um, set up uh, and expanded its network of Dal Bhat Kendras, which are uh, uh, units that provide uh, uh, meals to the needy at like throwaway prices. So it seems like that has been working well for the state. When it comes to hygiene practices, we know from studies that hand washing six to 10 times a day is very important for reducing the infection, um, uh, the chance of infection of coronavirus. What we saw was that um, the prevalent uh, hygiene practices were inadequate. And even when people were washing hands, uh, it, like more than half the respondents were not washing hands after touching, were coming in contact with surfaces. Um, social distancing, on the other hand, seems to be working well. Um, people had not visited uh, places of religious worships or made any non-essential trips. Most of the trips had been to banks or ATMs or to the marketplaces. So, so to sum up this finding, social distancing seems to be working probably due to the state machinery working well. But when it comes to behavior, people haven't been washing hands as much. Hand hygiene hasn't been up to the mark. So to summarize, there's good news on the government assistance and social distancing front and not so good news on the livelihood front and the hygiene practices front. So my first recommendation is actually out of a study I did myself last summer uh, where I was studying District Mineral Foundations in Jharkhand. And District Mineral Foundation was a trust that was set up in 2015, which collects royalties from uh, mining companies and uses that for the development of mining affected areas. And there are some priority areas of spending for DMFs or out of which livelihood generation is one. And where, while Jharkhand has the second largest um, DMF approval so far, it has not used any funds for skill development and livelihood generation. And what I recommended in my study last summer was that if you really want to reduce coal dependence in Jharkhand and you want to transition uh, the coal workers in coal mines away from the coal mines, then you really need to invest in alternative livelihood generation, especially forest products, which a lot of mining areas are rich in, cottage industries, and at the time of this pandemic, um, training of health workers. Uh, and this seems to be a good and opportune moment to do that because mining activity has slowed down and you have a lot of um, uh, workers in coal mines out of jobs. 
The second recommendation which um, I make, and I'm very impressed by the efforts that Jharkhand has been making by skill mapping its uh, migrant worker returnees, and the districts like Bukaro have created an online database of um, uh, skill map migrant workers, which they are sharing with companies and business establishments to hire out of. But the reason this strategy won't completely work is because unemployment in Jharkhand was already 7.5%, which is higher than the national average, uh, even before the work has returned and um, the, this pandemic has also created a, the demand for a new set of skills for instance you see home deliveries of groceries you see um, virtual consultations or online education and therefore um, merely stopping the buck at skill mapping won't be effective enough the state needs to go ahead a step ahead and actively invest in skill development and the financing of this relates to my earlier point of um, using dmfs for, for financing alternative livelihood generation and skill development. We know from the survey findings that social distancing seems to be working well, but hand hygiene, um, not so much. Uh, and one of the simplest ways to um, work on this is to invest in the accessibility and maintenance of um, uh, public toilets, especially with clean water and soap and also investing in sanitizer dispensers in a public space, especially public transit once we reopen. And finally, the central government has been coming out with a lot of um, uh, standardization of hygiene practices in the commercial establishments which will be reopening. Jharkhand can go a step ahead and, and use these SOPs as working documents for its own unique industries and establishments. And once these are in place, um, hygiene audits can be conducted uh, to increase compliance because this pandemic isn't going away anytime soon. We, are, we will reopen, but uh, that organizational behavior change is very uh, crucial because organizations and work offices will be, uh, will be one of the places where there'll be very high contact once, once we reopen after July 31st. So to sum up, um, any kind of resilient phasing out we we'll need two things. One, to study the impact that the lockdown has already had on the, on the livelihood and food security and hygiene practices in the state. And then using that information um, uh, after reopening to go ahead and then institute measures that we know will be, uh, will be, will be concentrated uh, where the impact has been. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Diksha, for presenting the, the research uh, that uh, ISEP conducted in Charkhand uh, together with uh, Morsel Research and Development, a Lucknow-based uh, research organization. Next, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Ray to give us uh, uh, some, some remarks. He is the uh, district uh, magistrate and collector at the uh, Ranchi district in Charkhand, so he has a, a very close view of the, of the situation on the ground. Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray, I think you are on mute right now, if you could unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, thanks Jonas for having me here and thanks Diksha for your thoughts. So a couple of things to set things in perspective. Ranchi district is the capital of Jharkhand and it's about 5,000 plus square kilometers in area and has about 3.3 million citizens. Uh, we have conducted about 21,851 uh, tests till now which would be the second highest in the state. And our testing per million is above state average and almost close to the national average, which is about 7,405 per million population. Our CDGR is about 6.27%. Our doubling rate is about 20 days, which is also the country's average. Uh, our, uh, we have about 130 active cases as of today. Uh, in the past one week, this has gone up by almost uh, 50 odd cases. Uh, as uh, Disha explained, uh, Rachi itself has been not, doesn't have a large migrant population which has come back from uh, other states, but it has been a hub for uh, movement of uh, migrant labor. Uh, the first uh, migrant train that was started in the country came to Rachi. We have also had about close to about 20,000 migrants who have returned to their home district. And like Disha pointed out, one of the greatest challenges has been the fact that how do we now keep them gainfully employed? So one of the reasons may have been that they left 
from Rachi or from Jharkhand was because of the lack of employment opportunities. In this, skill mapping is something that is being done by the government of Jharkhand and all states for all migrants through the Jharkhand Skill Promotion and Livelihood Society, which is an independent body so that all migrants, their skills can be mapped. And within the next three to five month period, we can have possible employment opportunities in Rachi, for example, or in other districts as well. One of the key findings like uh, Diksha pointed out was that food relief was able to reach. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that a priority of the state from day one was that no migrant, irrespective of the, the outreach that was required, no migrant was to go home hungry. And for that, there were a series of community kitchens set up but in each village, down to each village, there were mega kitchens set up, which allowed for all uh, urban areas to be fed. And close to about, for example, in Ranchi itself, close to about 1.6 like, uh, million meals have already been served in Ranchi district alone. And I think uh, this has been one of the greatest successes that we have. Even when migrant laborers came back, they had to be in first institutionally quarantined and later it was allowed for home quarantine. As a reason, they were given food relief, basically uh, dry rations for 14 days for the entire family so that the, the person could be home quarantined without actually having to go out or having to borrow money. While that is also endangering because a lot of uh, mig uh, COVID positive cases have come from migrant labor itself. Because a lot of migrant labor came back from Gujarat, Mumbai, two areas which are hotspots. Having said that, I think uh, the key challenge ahead is how do we ensure that there are livelihood opportunities for migrant labor in districts, within districts, and within the state itself. And for that, I think the greatest need today is absorption of those migrant labors in fields outside of Mandrega. As of right now, there is a extended focus on the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which is limited in its scope because it only is, a, is an immediate release program. Uh, Diksha, one of the things that you talked about was DMFT not having skill development or uh, livelihood initiatives, but that may actually have changed since last year. For example, in Rachi itself, we have about 500 plus uh, families which are uh, recipients of livelihood programs taken up under DMFT, whether it was uh, fish farming, cage fish farming, which was started or bamboo craft training or honey, uh, honey production, but more importantly than that, uh, adding value to honey production. So these are initiatives that have been taken up in DMFT. And when uh, I was in Bukaro about two years ago, we had sent about close to about 300 youth uh, under DMFT for skills training in uh, ITIs run by the government of India, which have already been placed. So at some level, DMFT is being used, obviously, like it can be used better, it can be used more for skill livelihood, but as of right now, there is a feeling because DMFT itself functions on a basis of feedback from the community. So there's a, there is a need felt by the community of infrastructure more than skill livelihood. I think, uh, Johannes, it would be better if I had questions and then would be able to answer them rather than continuing to get a monologue. Absolutely. Th thank you. Uh, thank you, Rai, for those very insightful remarks. Uh, I didn't realize that the first migrant train uh, was actually headed to Ranchi. Uh, that's, an, that's an interesting uh, piece of information. So, and Labor Day, that too. Okay, excellent. So um, we have a, already have some questions from the audience. And I'll just remind again the audience that uh, you can use the Q&A function um, at any time to ask a question. I'm then going to moderate it. So the first question that I have here is from uh, Surendra uh, Dubey, uh, who is, um, oh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, this is from Manoj Kumar uh, Pramanik, who is asking uh, about um, the state government's response to uh, the livelihood crisis, especially among uh, migrant workers. So uh, Diksha and Rai, do you have any uh, responses to this question? Sorry, I couldn't catch that. Could you repeat that again? Yes, so, so the question was, uh, during this pandemic, how is the state government of Charkhand uh, helping migrant workers with the livelihood crisis? So, uh, one of the key issues that is there, 
and will be there is that covid is not something that is going away in a hurry until we have a vaccine it is a permanent reality that we have to live with and webinars like this point to the future but uh, on a serious note the migrant issue is one that is the state is grappling with districts like ranchi are grappling with and the key is to be able to map job availability to skill sets that are present with migrants and that's what we are doing excellent um diksha did you have any any reactions to to this no no i can concur i think that um, i actually was really impressed by the skill mapping that is going on in jharkhand i personally found it um, very innovative and useful i'd love to um, see updates on how that is going whether what percentage of workers have been hired which i think we'll find out as data comes out from those online databases if they if they're collecting that data but uh, i do think that uh, skill development after the skill mapping will also be another step because like i said this pandemic isn't going away and neither are the migrant workers back to their jobs uh, anytime soon so i think skill mapping is a, is a great step that the state government has taken Excellent. So the next question is from uh, Salman Khurshid, uh, and uh, who is asking about testing for COVID-19, and uh, points out that uh, India generally has a very low testing rate. Uh, rate uh, Charkhand's rate is uh, even in lower. So, do you are you concerned about the uh, kind of lack of testing, and any thoughts on how that could be increased? uh so yes uh, mr kushid i think uh, you have a very fair very valid point having said that uh, i think infrastructural issues are something that is important and as i am speaking in a private capacity i cannot speak on behalf of the government of jharkhand or on uh, behalf of the government of india having said that i think uh, in ranchi as district disaster management authority head one of the key things that we have tried is test test and more test contact tracing is one of our most is one of our most important aspects that we are doing and it is the result of that that our uh, per million testing rate is actually one of the highest in the state that is about 7405.33 per million test conducted and even if you look at total test conducted that is still high having said that obviously there is a need for a much larger testing to be done that is constrained by the very nature of test as it is done because simply because it requires either testing can happen through two methods predominantly that is the rt pcr method or it is through uh, two nat machines or third is also an antigen method which is not been it does not lead to such successes so out of these two confirmed testing systems there is infrastructural limitations that come into play having said that i think testing is being increased almost on a weekly basis we are increasing testing capabilities whether it is private labs or government labs and i think uh, over the period of the next month there'll be a substantial increase in testing not just in ranchi but in jharkhand itself excellent thank you um next i have um anirudh budhia uh, is asking about kind of um building up the government capacity and uh sort of uh, motivating the, the the team so uh, i guess this is again for for rai um, so any thoughts on uh, how to sort of activate the government machinery and uh, keep the team morale high in in actually getting all these things done in a serious emergency like this i think uh, in any emergency situation especially one like a a covid situation which has no precedent in the past whether in administration or in any other i think uh, force multipliers are the way forward and in ranchi we've been especially lucky to be able to have a lot of civil society volunteer effort that has come through whether it is in terms of food relief whether it is in terms of relief uh, for uh, high comorbidity uh, uh, populaces for example senior citizens or it is uh, providing outreach to especially vulnerable communities like the lgbt or the casual sex workers or uh, Uh, hiv positive uh, patients i think one of the things that has set ranchi district apart is simply the amount of citizen volunteer effort that has happened and i think any district and any state or any country for that matter that is able to harness this volunteer this availability of expertise and manpower that is available simply because of the lockdown 
was able to fare better than those that weren't. Got it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, I have a, just a brief comment. Uh, this is from um, uh, Murari uh, Jodri, uh, who is uh, noting uh, that his organization, NIBS, is uh, launching a, a new uh, web uh, solution called uh, Kamdham, uh, which is going to link, uh, kind of track migrant populations and, and link them to different kind of uh, employment and livelihood uh, opportunities. And these solutions is being uh, launched out uh, next week uh, in Deoghat, and then after that in uh, more broadly in Bihar and, uh, and Charkar. So that's an exciting uh, initiative. Uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. Jodri, uh, for uh, launching this. Next, I have a, a question from uh, Pinky Roy, uh, who is asking about data on uh, government uh, meal provision. Is there any data on of how many meals uh, the government has been able to provide to uh, improve food security? Well, that question would have to be in each district specifically answered, but I can give you a rough estimate. For example, in, uh, in Ranchi district alone, over 1.6 million meals were served just during lockdown period one to three. And this does not include periods of unlockdown one and on lockdown too. Also, during the period of, uh, of uh, the lockdown, there was emergency relief ration. As, in, as you would know, the public distribution system gives out about 86% of population gets a ration in terms of rice mostly. To 86% of the population, there was emergency relief which was given out in terms of double of normal offtake in the month of March in the month of April, May and June, specifically for food relief. That number is available, but at, right now at the back of my hand, I've not had that. Got it, okay, excellent. Um, the next question that I have here is from Adhiraj Gupta, uh, who is asking about the district uh, mineral uh, funds. So um, is there any concern that the, the funds are being uh, diverted into kind of, um, activities or projects that are not uh, at the heart of the, of the, of the fund. So maybe uh, Diksha, do you have any, any thoughts on, on this one? So uh, it really depends from district to district. When I was serving um, some districts last summer about um, DMF, especially Hazari Bagh, I found that um, one, there was a lot of um, uh, distinction between districts on where, how these funds are being spread. Of course, it depends on the needs of the district as well. Uh, a lot of funds that Jharkhand is spending has been actually on health and sanitation, which, which are kind of priority areas for DMFT. Uh, like I said, they're now moving into also spending it on livelihood generation, which is good news for sure. Uh, but but what, what, I fa what I found was that because it's such a community driven ask to spend DMFT, a lot of times community members will get together and say, okay, we want a road or we want um, something infrastructure related because to them, the, 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 the payoffs of this infrastructure is pretty much in the present, like in the near future or the present. Um, whereas uh, the administration sometimes, like especially DMs that I spoke to, are more uh, keen to spend DMFT on uh, a, a more long-term project. So they'd want to spend it on health and something that doesn't give you tangible or very visible payoffs in the very in the in the present or the near future. And and so um, the the problem with DMFT is this: How do you reconcile what the community wants, and how do you grow the community to to understand that okay, this is where DMFT if spent on alternative, for instance setting up cold storage or supply chains for the alternative livelihood options that I talked about. If you're spending it on that, it might take a while for these livelihood options to go grow, but in a few years, you'll have the payoffs. Whereas for infrastructure, the payoffs are pretty much immediate. So I think the, the, the tension there is between what the community wants and what's popular versus what is actually sustainable. Perfect. Thank you. That's, that's, that's very good. Um, so we have lots of questions and a limited time. So I'm going to collect some questions and try to combine them. So we have some very interesting questions here on the skill mapping. Uh, and this comes from Asta Varma and Richa Shahu. Um, so they are asking about sort of the uh, limitations of skill mapping. So what about uh, on the other side of creating livelihood opportunities? So uh, skill mapping and skilling only work if there are jobs available 
uh, for those newly skilled people. So what are some measures on the other side to create job opportunities uh, for migrants, for other underemployed uh, people in the, in the state? And I'd like to, for this one, get brief comments both from uh, Diksha and uh, from Brian. So Diksha, do you want to say? you want to go first? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Please go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so do you want, do you want to go first, Ryan, or should I? Please, by all means, it's a tricky question. Yeah, I have a very, I have very brief, I have a very, because I touched upon this in my presentation as well. I think that, like I said, because this does tie into DMFT in the sense that you are going to be seeking skill development very, so it depends on whether you want skill development at the state level or very, very, pro, uh, very tailored to districts. Because if you're saying that intrastate movement is also um, under curb, so intrastate movement in Jharkhand is now being open, private taxis are allowed, but if you still have a restriction on intrastate movement, you might want to cater to skill development, which are very specific to districts per se, so that the workers can be very locally employed rather than even moving intrastate uh, between districts. So those are the comments that I have that even when you're looking at uh, reopening, uh, focusing on skill development, which is which is very much based on the local needs. And by local, I mean as local as the district or the town would be more useful than at this point focusing on a state level because we don't know when the second phase of the lockdown will happen, when we'll have a second wave of the virus. So maybe intrastate travel will again have to be limited. So the workers will become migrants in their own state because they went from their home district to another district to work. So, so those are the only brief insights that I had. On the Mr. Rai? Yeah. So, uh, Asta, to answer your question, the demand side is a problem. Having said that, there is an initiative. Uh, we've seen it in Orissa, we've seen it in Jharkhand with regard to make in locally campaigns. Having said that, that will take some time. Yet, when you, for Rachi personally, I can speak, we had a consortium of uh, migrants who've come back from Surat they have uh, skill advantages in, in uh, the apparel sector. And we were able to use them for production of one of the cheapest, call it, cheapest rates of PPEs when PPEs were not available. So uh, these are things that have required, and each one of them will require an innovative solution. For example, in Giridi district, I was speaking to the district magistrate there, he's a friend of mine. There are people who've come back from the school of diamond industry. Now having their getting absorbed and creating demand side will be a large problem. Having said that, when you have uh, migrants who have come back from Mumbai who have skill sets as drivers, it is easier to incorporate them, train them, get them uh, with local industry contacts and get them rehabilitated, get them employment opportunity. It's a difficult and tricky question, but we are persistent and I'm, I hope by the end of the year, Jharkhand and Ranchi will see substantial progress in it. Excellent, uh, thank you. Um, next, um, just a very brief uh, comment maybe from, uh, from Mr. Rai. Uh, so Nagendra Pashwan is asking about the hygiene practices in, in Jharkhand. Uh, is that a concern in this COVID-19 situation, uh, kind of hand washing and other similar behaviors? It is definitely a concern. Uh, as uh, we all know, there is no substitute to hand washing as far as the COVID crisis is concerned. Having said that, we have just recently been able to achieve, achieve ODF status, which itself has its own lacuna. I am hopeful that the campaigns that were launched in 2019, 2018, as part of the Swaj Bharat mission, especially for hand washing among children, have led to some incremental growth. The focus will have to be in the coming months to ensure that sanitation is one of the priority areas. Excellent, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so next I have a question from uh, Mohua uh, Mukherjee, uh, who is asking about um, the challenge of sort of support for livelihood programs. So things like, uh, I don't know, um, honeybee keeping or textile and all of that. Uh, is it possible to partner with, let's say, some marketing firms and private sector to uh, create maybe some kind of a procurement commitment uh, to 
allow these uh, livelihood programs to grow and have enough demand? Any, any thoughts on that? I'll direct this to uh, Mr. Rai. So uh, in Rachi, I can tell you, I'm not, um, I won't be able to answer the state of Jharkhand. I think Diksha would be able to take it up from there. One of the key points that we've been able to take up with regard to trifed, uh, to regard to honey and other tribal produce is trifed. Trifed is an organization that is pan India. It's a tribal federation uh, marketing cooperative. They have uh, online presence. They have about 400 plus stores all over the country. We have partnered with them extensively for sale of as diverse as liter of light products to honey in a pouch product. And I'm sure that the marketing base that they provide, as a matter of fact, the experience experiment that started with Ranchi is now a pan India uh, initiative. So every district can directly now approach TriFed and ask for their products to be sold to the TriFed network. Okay, excellent. Over to you, Disha. Diksha, do, do you like to add something? Yeah, I think that um, from what I saw in Hazaribagh, even though this this is one of the models that is, um, because it really intrigues me, what model do you follow even when you're trying to generate alternative livelihoods, especially in forest products and cottage industries? And one of the things that I saw was that the tribal population there is already, um, is already extracting these forest products. So, so one way would be to empower these local farmers instead of uh, instead of getting a third party, for instance, to come in and commercialize, which could have its own uh, community tensions, which from from or civil unrest, from what I can uh, preempt. Um, and one model would be if it's if it's something that is not so much at the heart of what tribal farmers are already doing, you could try to create uh, create a supply chain for that. For instance, if they are not already extracting mahua seeds, you could go in and say, okay, this company is going to do it. But if they're already doing it, it again becomes a political issue where you are giving um, rights to tribal land to 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 third parties. So I think this is this is certainly a very important question, and uh, districts should do it based on the tribal population and what practices they follow. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question uh, directed to uh, Adiksha uh, based on the, the, the survey research is, um, so any insights on the impact of the pandemic on farmers and agriculture in particular? Did you see anything there? Oh, so we certainly saw that farming, um, I can just go down the slides. We certainly saw that farming was, um, was the second most affected and uh, farming labor seems to be to be less affected than than farmers per se have been and i and the reason i think this is is because um uh because it was harvest season and a lot of them were just not able to sell it even to the even to the 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 mandis um so i certainly farmers have been affected i I am I'm less placed to answer how exactly they've been affected. I think Rai, if Rai could answer that, if, if, if he would have insights on how exactly and what are the main uh, agricultural products that have been affected, that would be helpful. But I do know from the survey findings itself that, that certainly farming was the second most affected source of income. Excellent. Uh, Rai, would you like to comment on this? See, uh, when the lockdown happened, thankfully the major uh, agricultural seasons that is Kharif, and Rabi both were not directly or indirectly affected because uh, because of the timing that happened. What was definitely was affected was vegetable farming. For example, whether it was watermelons, which are traditionally grown during the Ramzan period uh, because there is a large consumption of it, or even vegetables that were grown by small scale vendors who use it to augment their income. Uh, that those were completely affected simply because of shutdown of markets, shutdown of linkages, and with, with limited cold storage capacity, cold chain management, those products did go waste. One example that I can give you is that we had a request coming in one of the helplines where a person had almost about 200 tons of watermelon that was going waste. Uh, he donated about 50 tons of it, which we passed it on through the food relief network. The rest, we use Twitter to get some sale. Same thing with pumpkins. Uh, pumpkins, about 80 tons by a farmer were lying. He donated it to the CM Relief Kitchen simply because he had no way of being able to take it to the market. 
Excellent. Thank you. That, that's a very, uh, very useful insight and interesting uh, data on this. Also, on the other side, the other side that is there is that uh, now with the sowing season for rice, there has been increase in sowing simply because there are more migrants who have come back and uh, land under sow, sow has gone up. Thank you. So uh, next I have a, a question from, uh, from Dia uh, BT, who's asking about the uh, Bir Saharit Bakwani Yojna, uh, which uh, if I understood this correctly, is an uh, afforestation uh, scheme uh, in, in no. Turkey. And so- uh, No, uh, it's not an afforestation scheme. It's a scheme for uh, increasing uh, fruit bearing orchards. I see, okay, so, so horticulture. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a question on the on the scheme is um, so uh, how many people have benefited from this scheme and how much land uh, has been converted uh, in this scheme? So uh, the target set by the state itself for each village was about five hectares uh, to be converted into uh, horticulture, whether it is a mango orchard or a guava orchard. Having said that, there's no upper limit. And the, those data, that data is available on the Mandrega website, also on the government of Dharthan website. But every uh, village or every panchayat has to take up at least five hectares. So, thank you. Um, I have, I'm gonna take just um, two more questions and, and then after that, uh, we'll, we'll move into closing remarks. I want to hear uh, some reflection both from, uh, from Mr. Rai and uh, from, from uh, Diksha as well. So the, the first question I'm going to take is from Navneet Pati, who's asking about mushroom cultivation. Is this a livelihood that uh, could uh, play a role in, in Charkhand in the future? Any, any, does anybody happen to know this, uh, Rai or Diksha? Mushroom cultivation is already underway. Uh, it has been something that has been promoted by the JSLPS, Jharkhand State Livelihood Promotion Scheme, for SHG women because it is something that can happen in households. And traditionally, households in Rachi and Jharkhand tend to be uh, in a veranda model. So there are spaces where dark spaces exist for which organic mushroom farming would be very suitable. Having said that, again, it leads to the question of linkages of demand. So mushroom cultivation is actually that is something that, are, that is being done, that is being promoted. Having said that, I think uh, until unless there is a supply chain that is established between major mushroom users versus the cultivators, it is not gonna be able to completely take off. The same way, for example, you have uh, turmeric, somebody asked this question about turmeric and ginger, uh, one of the districts has done great work in looking at local ginger, which is supposed to be better uh, as far as uh, normal ginger is concerned for throat uh, related issues. There is a need for demand and supply linkages to be established. Until unless those are, it'll, it will remain a problem. Okay. Excellent, all right. Um, I will next um, want to touch base a little bit on the workers in the Kind of industry and mining, uh, which is an uh, obviously very important area, especially mining in, in Chargon. So uh, Pinky Roy is, is asking about that. Uh, is there any specific plan or scheme for supporting or dealing with unemployment and underemployment in industrial and uh, mining uh, areas? Diksha, or should I? I have only, I, from what I know is that mines at the moment, um, for instance, this mine in Jamshedpur had one COVID case and they shut down the entire mine. So mines have so far been, uh, been taking their own prerogative in terms of assessing the health risk and then slowing or not slowing operations. But I'm, I'm less sure of what the state guidelines and whether state has even developed SOPs about mining operations yet about this, if I would know. Uh, so, Disha, uh, actually, the thing is that there are SOPs in place, which the MHA Ministry of Home Affairs and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India have decided. And those have, in total, mostly been uh, adopted by the state government. So, industry, major industries were actually continuing even through lockdown one, lockdown two, and lockdown three. Uh, with regard to mine closure because of a COVID positive case, more, what would have most likely happened is that any space, working space, where you have a COVID positive uh, patient coming up, you have what is called sanitization and sterilization of that area over two days. 
So any such space has to have at least a 48 hour period where activity ceases. So in all probability, that was what would happen. Mining as such has not been as badly affected by, and industry has not been as badly affected, heavy industry, not small scale industry, not medium scale industry, but heavy industry, for example, the iron ore plants, uh, the coal mines, the iron ore mines have not been as adversely affected as other sectors, especially uh, service sectors. If you compare it to service sectors. Got it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So, um, in, in the interest of time, I would now just like to invite uh, sort of a brief remarks again from our uh, panelists. And so what I'm going to do is, uh, Diksha, I'm just going to ask if you have just in a few minutes any, any thoughts based on the discussion, anything you'd like to sort of highlight or bring up, and then I'll uh, let uh, Mr. Rai uh, conclude our discussion with uh, kind of a brief reflection. Yeah, I had very brief concluding remarks, mostly because um, I'm a behavioral economist by training. And one thing we haven't talked about a lot in this webinar is how do you, once it reopens, how do you get people to wear masks more often or wash hands more often or even so much as, or when to wash hands or um, use sanitizers uh, and, I, and or maintain social distancing. And I think that um, Niti Aayog has been running a, a really good campaign called New Normal. Uh, where they've been developing a lot of behaviorally informed um, interventions for getting people to adopt, for instance, wearing of masks, and they've been contextualizing a lot of these interventions. So I think the way forward, um, uh, aside from the livelihood and food security implications that we've discussed, is to also really look at the behavior change that hygiene practices require, and perhaps develop, this, develop a state level intervention or district level intervention on uh, getting community leaders to um, motivate people to, to take these things seriously. So, so, so behavior change is going to be a big um, aspect of how well a state does or does not do on, on the recovery phase. I don't call it reopening, I call it recovery phase. And, and I think behavior change is going to be one of the biggest determinants of that. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you, Diksha. And uh, Mr. Roy, uh, please, uh, your remarks. Uh, the worst part about concluding remarks is that you're often proved wrong in hindsight. <laughs> so, uh, but let me still have that, I guess. Uh, one of the things that I think the greatest takeaway that the COVID crisis as of today has brought in is that the crisis is far from over. At no point till now have we seen a peak either in Jharkhand or maybe even India. So there's a lot that needs to be handled as the future evolves. Also, I think uh, the one of the takeaways will be that how fast can administrations and economies adapt to the new normal, the word that the Niti Aayog has been. One of, the, one of the better points that has come out in rural Jharkhand, and especially in rural Ranchi, is that whether it's a social distancing or behavioral change, the COVID crisis has created a lot of fear, which is automatically brought about Things like we've seen, we see places uh, which have forbidden any migrant worker from going out and doing a daily wage job in the city. So whereas in urban areas, there is a more of a problem of, of social distancing not being followed. In rural areas, there is stigma that is being attached, which is a greater problem. Having said that, social distancing does not seem to be such a problem in a district like Ranchi, which has, urban, uh, which has a rural area, which is wide, widespread. Secondly, I think uh, one of the things like, for example, what we are looking at uh, launching in Rachi is basically alleviating the problems of migrant laborers working in the service sector, which is an area that requires intermediate intervention. Those that are, have skill sets within industry will at some level be incorporated either back in their own industry, if it is available in Jharkhand or outside, or they may have developed enough entrepreneurial skills to be able to take it up, or they may be able to be reskilled with relatively less cost to take up another industry. Those that were in the service sector will be the worst hit because they were working in an urban scenario, say in Mumbai or in Delhi or in Varadra, where they have come back and they find that those and none of their skill sets are viable here. For example, there's a large number of uh, migrant labor who used to work during the summers in Ladakh and during the winters in Goa as 
hotel management employee as hotel staff as a chef now the kind of resources that they have at their disposal the skills that they have at their disposal doesn't seem to be able to match the demand that there is or there is supply so one of the things that we trying out in ranchi is something like a equivalent of a of a app aggregator which allows for general populace to demand services and these migrants who have already been skill mapped to be provided to them for example i may require i may not require a driver every day i'm not require a chauffeur every day but if i require it for 3 days in a month i should be able to find someone who has come back in the migrant base of about we have about 860 odd uh, chauffeurs who have registered themselves as drivers and so in out of the 860 if we are able to give employment to 500 of them i think that will be itself a huge success story coming back final points about dmf uh, i think uh, diksha answered the question is basically a mismatch between aspirations which which can be seen in the immediate in terms of infrastructure whether it is drinking water whether it's roads versus investment in education investment in nutrition which are which have an effect long term but do not appeal to general populace immediately so uh, i think dmft is not the only solution having said that it is only a method by which historically distortions in the economy caused because of mining distortions caused in the geographical uh, in the environmental space caused because again of mining can be rectified or remedied to a certain extent and i think dmft should be taken in that light itself excellent uh, thank you um so uh, th this has been a very very insightful webinar so so i'd like to thank first of all our panelists for taking the time to uh, attend and of course uh, riksha for producing the the research uh, behind this it's available on our website at size-icf.org i'd also like to thank uh, our uh, program manager shanda hurt uh, for waking up very early to to run this seminar at 7 a.m. Uh, in, in the morning here on Eastern Coast. I'd like to thank the ICEP team, uh, Sonakshi Saloja and Vagesh Anandan for uh, putting together this webinar. And I would of course like to also thank our partner, uh, Morsal Research and Development for uh, supporting and uh, doing this research together with us. And of course, uh, most importantly, uh, all of the uh, attendees for, for joining us and uh, asking such interesting questions. Um, I personally hope that Jharkhand will get the COVID-19 situation under control. I was looking forward to visiting the state this summer, but I was not able to do it because of the crisis. So I very much hope we in Ranchi uh, sooner rather than later. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I look forward to uh, continuing all this work and uh, discussion with all of you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.